NerdsReviews.com presents Nerds Talking, the podcast. Yo! We talk about lightsabers, stunning your TV screens, what you want to stream, everything beyond your dreams. Want to talk about movies, sports, or even politics? Go ahead and tune in to us, we'll give you all of it. Whatever you debate, next box of PlayStation, Marvel the DC, Mac or PC. Terra flops when the movie drops, gigabytes, chips, RAM, no matter what it is, we got all of it. Welcome to the show. Nerds Talking, the podcast. Welcome to Nerds Talking, the podcast. This is our soccer special as we talk about, well, soccer. We have a bunch of guests joining us today. Carlos, as you know, he's the co-host of the show. Hello. And we have Danny Pinto, who also has his own soccer podcast. Danny, fill us in real quick on what you got going on. Yeah, man. Uh, thank you guys for uh, for having me on. Um, I host the uh, Celeção podcast, which is a podcast about the Portuguese national team i actually just um finished up my latest episode today you'll be hearing it tomorrow so if you got apple itunes spotify all that uh just uh, go ahead and uh, hit me up on uh, the less on podcast and uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a good time to cover portuguese soccer as uh, they are doing quite well but obviously we are here today to talk about the united states and soccer so good to be here boys thank you for Thanks coming on we got Emery, who is the director of Placer United. Emery, say hello. Hi, guys. And um, I've been coaching, playing the rest, uh, almost all my life. And coaching about uh, 30 years. And wow. since five, six years old, touching the ball, playing almost every level, except the highest level professional. But uh, right now, I just came from the field. So I still involved with the youth soccer heavily. Nice. And Maurice, who has been on the show before in our, our gaming episode about streaming. Give me your background on soccer, Maurice. Um, I'm probably like not competitive. I've, I played throughout my whole childhood. I played with Danny here. Uh, I think I played yeah, with you, you guys too. I played with you guys too you when we played for Benfica. And then uh, the little, yep. our little Sacramento area Benfica, not the real Benfica. But um, yeah, um, I played, I followed soccer and football for like my whole life. You know, it's just like, it's, it's a passion, especially because we're Portuguese and we've always like followed the, the Portuguese team, the national team. And now like even with us being here in the United States, we still follow the United States. We take pride in that too, I think as well. Oh yeah. And we got Carlos as well. He still plays soccer at age, what, 50? 46. Thank you. Ah, close enough. We round oh, up. Sad. Round nah. up. All right, fellas, thanks for coming to the show, Nerds Podcast, Nerds Talking, I should say. Um, so we're going to start. It's all about American soccer here today. It's around the horn style. So I'll bring up the talking points and we'll go around. You guys give your, your opinion on it and your take. And we're going to start off with the American soccer and the pay to play format, which Carlos can touch on that for a minute. Um, what is the pay-to-play format that you are bringing up? Well, just as it says, pay-to-play. I mean, you have to pay to play soccer in the United States. Um, and the downside is if you can't afford to play, I mean, to pay, then you're not going to play. I mean, the U.S. misses out on a lot of talent due to this format. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Emery and Danny. I really don't think it's going anywhere. I think business comes first when it comes to the U.S. All right. Emery, what do you think about that? Well, this is the over 30 years in the uh, United States soccer. I learn as I go. And, uh, and you're right about the pay to play. So all the clubs are structured by volunteers and uh, small budgets and different type of levels they call or they identify themselves and uh, able to rent the fields and uh, find some coaches and equipments and type of things has money involved. So they have to distrib- distribute those, uh, the price and the cost. And uh, higher you go, you have to get more serious and you have to find more professionals to help the youth soccer. So it become a job and this structure based on the 
demand and based on the how how we how we go, unfortunately you have to pay the play. All right, so all right. Same way with other uh, countries and cultures. Yeah, yeah. And then Danny, what's your take on the American soccer pay to play youth? It's more in the youth, um, but what's your take on that? Well, for me, it's the you know just in terms of cost. Soccer is one of the more expensive uh, sports, uh, solely based on the amount of kids you have on a team. You know, with basketball, you see how AAU operates in basketball. It's half the size of a soccer team. Um, yeah, you're buying sneakers at $120, $130 a pair, but um, just travel costs and, you know, the, the renting of facilities and all that, all that stuff is half the price at the very least of what anyone is doing in soccer. Uh, it's solely based on the pay to play format. And on top of that, this country still has not done a good enough job of reaching out to its best athletes to play the game of soccer. Now, maybe we're just not fundamentally there, uh, but you know, you look at the athletes and the, and the superstars in football, in basketball, in baseball, um, in hockey, even we know that this country of nearly 350 million people, we, we should be able to field a, a team of 22 guys that should be competing um, on in, every four years in the World Cup and, you know, see what you want about the Gold Cup every two years, whatever it is. But there should be a competitive squad in this country. And uh, in recent history, it hasn't been there. I think it, it was embarrassing that the team didn't qualify for the World Cup um, four years ago. Uh, a lot of young players now plying their trade in England and in Italy and uh, in Germany. So it's, it's good there. But in terms of cost alone, it's a very expensive project to be involved in solely based on, you know, the number of, of kids that need to be involved in order to have teams function. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right about that. Uh, Maurice, what did you take? I mean, do you think kids should stick to the high school route? Uh, or, you know, or do you feel like they have to play youth soccer to really to really gauge their skill, their talent uh, to even play the high school route? Um, I think like Danny and is it it's Emery, right? Yes. They both, they both touched on things that like I, I view like it costs money to, to play, you know, for these guys to get better. They need the better coaching. They need the better the fields, the staff to get them to improve, you know. And then like Danny said, we can't even reach the cream of the crops of like athletes because unfortunately most of these sports that we watch, all these athletes come from what lower income areas, you know, they, 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 they can't afford to play soccer. So unfortunately we pretty much price out all the players that might have a chance to make an impact on the United States, you know, soccer because they can't play. If you think about it, you know, like a LeBron James or, or, you know, some guy that was really good at another sport, maybe he liked soccer, but unfortunately he couldn't play it because his mom couldn't afford it. And so I think it, you get a good point. Danny brought up a great point. If you think about youth sports, um, people, I mean, kids, kids aren't, I should say organized youth sports besides soccer. There isn't like kids clamoring to play youth basketball when they get past a certain age. Right. But soccer, they continue playing it, you know, um, and it's it feels like there's more soccer leagues than anything else you can join as a kid, like a ton of them, where there isn't you can't just go join a football league. You know, there isn't, you know, the neighborhood football league. There isn't the of course, there's baseball, but that's dirt cheap. Any any kid can play baseball. Most of the kids suck at it anyway. So, yeah, but yeah, soccer is definitely something where it is it's expensive. You're right. I mean, I. Carlos can, you know, join on this one. Just running a team is expensive. Even when we coached a, what they considered amateur semi-pro adult league, it was expensive as hell. Buying all the uniforms for everybody, making sure they had all everything they needed, uh, paying for the league fees, the referees. It just keeps adding up and adding up. And even as adults, they don't even want to pay. They show up, oh, I don't want to pay my fees. I wanna, I'll play for your team, though. Even they don't want to pay. <laughs> 
You know, I'm like, you have a job. I'm, I'm, ah, I don't care. I'm too good to pay. <clears throat> like, you know. Oh, well, he's able to play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what I team, mean? As a team, you need those players. Yeah, and that's the thing. You, you're like, okay, I'll pay your fees, damn it. I need you at forward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's crazy. It's, uh, so, it's crazy how people don't think that, how expensive soccer is. It is an expensive sport to. It doesn't to have to be. It doesn't. It no, you're right. It doesn't have to be. You're you're hundred percent correct. It doesn't have to. It, it could be just as inexpensive as the other sports. I actually, it should be cheaper than any any other sport because uh, I came from Turkey. You guys mm -hmm. from Portugal, and uh, all you need to have, not even a cleats. If you have a sneaker, and you have a short, and you have a short, you're good to go. Unfortunately, structures built in the United States is a little bit different. And there's a lot of disconnections. So you said uh, youth basketball, youth baseball, or American football, right? Mm -hmm. They're connected from the neighborhood to the schools, mm -hmm. to the college, and the pro. There's a system in place. So as a parent, you follow those, and they're consistent each other. So uh, the parent sees that there's a future for my kid and able to get a scholarship from the college, get a scholarship from somewhere to be qualified if you don't have a money because you're talented. In soccer, even when you're talented, those elements and uh, construction, it's not, structure's not there. So you have to go to the private clubs. You cannot go to your high school team or middle school team to play because season's too short and a couple teachers runs the program. They have no soccer background. And they have no idea. They're just putting kids together and play. Then the kids has no connection from there to go to college with the scholarship. Nobody offers them. So, uh, soccer Clark uh, scholarships these days about a two thousand dollars, three thousand dollars. Except the ladies' side. Ladies' side is as a full scholarships. That's why you see the woman soccer is very um, strong in the United uh, the world because there's a structure and path. To follow so hopefully yeah yeah sense. yeah no you're right that's and that's how i look at it i look at it as as kids in other sports they look forward to playing high school soccer because they know that's the next level to get them where they want to be mm -hmm. and you're right youth soccer there's not that outlook it's just i'm going to keep playing soccer in this league that might not get me anywhere but i'm going to keep paying to play because i want to play you know yes. and that's just you know that's the take on it and that's how it is when i coach a team it was just guys wanting to pay to play that's it. I just, I want to play. Here's some money. Uh, oh, you're not very good. I don't, but I don't care. Come play on my team anyway. You pay the fee. You well, know. It's, it's funny you said that. I mean, I see a lot of talented players. Sometimes I go out there and recruit them from the parks. Yep. And most likely the Hispanics or some other culture kids. Uh -huh. And, uh, but the mom and dad doesn't have enough money to support that. Even sometimes I pay from my pocket or give them a ride. But Diversity is so much in the soccer that everybody calls themselves comp team, ODP teams, <laughs> uh, the academy teams. Yeah. In my eyes, they're no different. They're all grassroots teams because they're youth. And, um, but they promise a lot of things that they cannot deliver. A lot of clubs has no identity. They call themselves a rec soccer. Then all of a sudden, oh, I have a comp team. And uh, a lot of them is run by the volunteer coaches, mom and dad no knowledge. They just know on the street or from their own background. Uh, the, if you compare to other sports, we, are, we have a lot of deficit on that end too. So um, those players that are very talented, don't have a lot of money, they have nowhere to go because one tournament is in the different city or different town. Now we have to go travel. We have to pay the hotel, lodging and everything else over the weekend tournaments. It's a lot of cost. So average family these days, if they play organized soccer, they're paying about a forty-five thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of money. Oh I yeah. Mean, you say four to five or forty-five? Four to five, four, right? Four to five. Four to this five. Is average. Yeah. That is a lot. I mean, I mean, that's in, gone up. Obviously. Yeah. I mean, because we're looking at about two hundred dollars a month fees, gears, and lodging on the. If you go to tournament, tournaments are expensive. Each team pays about a thousand dollars now these days. If you have a tournament, so you're paying the hotel and this and that. That's a big 
commitment for parents that they have two income and four kids. Oh yeah, no, it's expensive. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, tough. Yeah, it's really expensive. Uh, Danny, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, you you have to figure out, and, and I, I think I, I think the the whole the whole issue with with it in this country is what uh, what was said earlier about you can't look at soccer in the same manner in which you look at basketball, football, and baseball in terms of that next level in, in doing the whole school, high school, college, because by the time that, that senior year is over for an American kid who's gone through that, that whole system, he's 22, he's 21, 22, 23 years old. The, he hasn't been part of any kind of club association. It's only been the college structure, which to be honest, I'm not f- too familiar with, but from everything that I've read and from everything that I've, you know, in, in talking with a lot of people who are kind of against it, it doesn't fulfill what a United States national team is looking for on the men's side. Uh, as, as, as was said earlier, the women's side, yeah, there's more money there going through that system. But, you know, you're looking at, you're looking at all these younger players now who – you know, are, are applying their trade in Europe and none of them went to college to play soccer in this country. They were all, you know, there's that Braden, that Bradenton Academy in Florida, which is probably the closest thing to a, um, I guess, national, like a, like a, na- a national setting to get these players ready for that next level internationally to leave the States to go play in, in England and in Spain and in Germany. Yeah, there, there are success stories in the MLS where it's gone or, the, you know, they've gone through college and stuff. And, but internationally for the bigger name players, that's few and far between. You know, guys like Landon Donovan didn't play college ball. Guys like Clint Dempsey didn't play college ball. You know, a guy like Jordan Morris, who is probably the best player to play college soccer uh, that the states have produced in, in the last maybe five, 10 years, he's, he's the exception. He isn't the rule. You know, uh, you know, Tom Brady going to Michigan is the rule in football. Uh, yeah, you're you know, right. Yeah. You know, so it's just, correct. it's just such, so, it's, it's something that the American culture just has not grasped in no, terms of no. developing soccer in this country. Yeah. And well, you're right. You're right. Because when you think about what you just said, When's the last time ESPN told you you have to watch this soccer player out of Syracuse? And we're going to keep you showing do? you his... <laughs> John Wallace. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. John Wallace. Like, we, <laughs> and we're going to keep showing you his soccer highlights. Oh, my God, he's the next big thing. No, because, yeah, yeah college soccer here is... It's, well, it's, it, it's what soccer is in the States in general. It's fourth, fifth place in the sports, you know. So it's a replication of what the MLS is. And if that's the product, that's the product. But we can't also be surprised that the product internationally hasn't improved over the years like we thought it might. And I think it's slowly getting there on the bigger scale. But again, you, it, the, and I know that we're, we're talking youth soccer here, but, uh, but with these younger players in, 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 in Europe playing and now playing for the United States today, you know, they had the, the, uh, the friendly against Wales. You know, a lot of those kids are, are not what the system is currently in the States. And internationally, you have to take advantage of that while they're playing, but you have to fix a system that is too replicated on the other big sports that just doesn't work for this sport in this country. Yeah, no, you're right about that. Yeah. Are you familiar? Are you guys familiar with the how the Europe or other countries, uh, the soccer system works in the youth to the professional? Are you guys familiar with? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. Somewhat. Uh, I'll give you an example from my country, but very similar in Europe. So you start playing soccer in the, your neighborhood, okay, in the street, and all of a sudden, you start. You have a neighborhood team. And uh, these teams are connected to the, your major teams and professional teams. And uh, their job is to feed the system. So they're not saying that I'm going to be better than you. It says, hey, I'm, let's say Benfica, I'm working for Benfica club, but I'm in the youth soccer. So I, my job is to promote player 
and send it to Benfica. And with that, when this per, uh, players become uh, age 14 to 15 to 16, it will be the, his first sign-up contract. In that first sign-up contract, uh, part of the money goes to the club that who raised them. So mm. club able to get money. And that way they can stay in the business and able to find more players that are talented. And also they don't, uh, those parents, uh, those players don't have to, they don't have to pay anything. So to the player side is free. The clubs get feed by professional teams because they need those youth players. So you guys see that sometimes uh, the brand new, let's say in the Barcelona, uh, the, some brand new guys, he's age 17, 18. All of a sudden, uh, where this guy came from. But if you look at his history, the behind, probably three, four clubs before he comes to the Barcelona. So Barcelona pays those fees, those clubs, because those clubs has to get paid. The structure is totally different. So that's why a lot of recruiters goes out there on the streets, on the neighborhood, neighborhood games, start identifying those players. And yeah. they select the players from there. Hopefully it makes sense. Yeah, it's like a, it's like yeah. a farm system. Yeah, it's, yep. it's, it's almost like baseball. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or, yeah, where the Yankees feed three teams the yes. money to keep building their players up and then send them yes. up. Like certain c- clubs in uh, uh, Spain, Valencia or some other clubs, they're well known, they're academy players club. Yeah, Their yeah, job yeah. is to promote players. They're never going to be top 10 every time because they don't have that budget, but they survive promoting and transferring players to the other clubs. So they get paid. Well, there you go. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this on Nurse Talking the Podcast with more soccer. Nerdsreviews.com for all your latest in tech, video games, movies, and more. Go to Nerdsreviews.com today. Welcome back to Nerds Talk in the podcast, our soccer edition. We have a question from Carlos here in the segment. Um, go ahead and lead us off what you have. Well, first, I want to uh, touch, touch real quick on what uh, Danny and Maurice were saying and what um, Emery was saying. Like scouting, I think scouting is a big problem when it comes to, to uh, youth soccer I mean, if you were to put basketball into play, scouts, they, you know, they will scout the local gyms, they'll sc- scout the local blacktops, you know, in the parks, this and that. But I think in soccer, what the scouting is that they really, they really just scout college and, you know, the high-end tournaments. I mean, you don't see these scouts going out to the parks and looking at the kids, you know. You don't see them hanging out with the youth practices. Like, you know, Emory, you're not going to have a scout hanging out with your practice to look at your kids, well, right? No. no, because, and that's part, I think that's another part of the problem. And it's, 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 scouting is a big problem. I mean, that's why some of these kids, they leave soccer because, so obviously, because some of the other games are more popular and they have a better chance of getting picked up and scouted if they're that good, right? I mean, funny, funny, you said, just said that age 12 to 14, most of the soccer players quit. We lose most of the best players. We, they quit, they go to basketball, lacrosse. And uh, believe it or not, play rugby, but they don't play soccer. They quit. And I, I can see that. I can see that kids quit at that age because of interest and because of parents, you know. Yeah. And parents, um, uh, I think you're done playing that, you know. Go play your Xbox. You know, you, you, you know, oh, I want to go play, you know, this now, you know. I mean, Maurice, did you, what age did you play and what age did you tell yourself, eh, I don't want to play anymore? Uh, I, I played for a pretty long time. I think I was like seven years old, six years old, seven years old, eight years old when I first started playing. And then I played throughout junior high all the way to high school. And I think once I started working in high school, I stopped playing. And then I started playing again when I was like 17, 18. And I played till I was 20, I think it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you have a passion for it, you have a passion for it. I don't think you're let that change. But unfortunately you know like like danny said earlier you know they have certain steps in certain sports that you progress through you know high school college then pro soccer 
it whittles down, you know, it's like you could play high school, but it doesn't mean you're going to get scouted to go to college. So that makes it a little bit narrower. And then I just think the avenues for these people to have success in any type of sport isn't there with soccer. It's just yeah. not, you know, unfortunately. So just yeah. the kids get tired and don't see a, a path in front of them. So they don't want to play anymore. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, well, the other thing Danny? too is that if oh, you go ahead, Carlos. get to college to play soccer, you're already like in Euro terms, you're, you're in your prime. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So here in you're the U.S., your if you're playing college, that's it. I time. mean, your highest level, if yeah. you're lucky, is MLS. You're not going to Europe. And now a lot of these players feel, I'm sure they feel that if they don't make it to Europe, they failed as a yeah. soccer player, yeah. right? Because that's, that's their goal. You know, they want, they want to be the next Neymar. They want to be the next Messi, right? It's but you're not, not going to be there. Either. If you go to college, it's a three-month season. It's so short. They, play, they spend no time on this. And when colleges cut sports, they cut soccer first. They're not going to cut football. They're not going to cut baseball or basketball. So in the U.S., I mean, that's a big problem. If you want your kid to succeed as a soccer player, in my eyes, you got to take them to Europe. You got to make that step and make that personal sacrifice if you can, if you're a citizen of another country, or if you get accepted by these other clubs. I mean, you will rarely get scouted by other clubs here in the U.S., especially, I mean, to me, college is it. I mean, if you play college ball, congratulations, you play college ball. And if you're lucky to get to the MLS, cool. But that's it. I mean, just that's, that's, I mean, that's how I see it anyway. Yeah, but my question is uh, for Danny. I mean, wouldn't you see reaching the MLS as 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 a U.S. player, like the top goal in a sense, not necessarily playing in Europe? Because I think that's a stretch. U.S. players playing in Europe as well. Uh, I would disagree. If you, you know, the the thing about soccer in this country that um, I think is a big positive in the just the amount of players that we do have. Uh, Playing, uh, playing overseas, believe it or not, and Reese, uh, uh, you know, as a gaming guy, FIFA on Xbox and FIFA on PlayStation has given these kids an ability to identify with the Neymars and the Messis and Ronaldos and Gareth Bales and, 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 all these, and all these players that, you know, when, when you're learning how to play FIFA, you know, you're, you're going to you know, the team that has the highest rating. Well, the highest rated team has the best players. And then you familiarize yourself with that. Then all of a sudden in the last 10, 15 years, you've seen that the United States has, you know, purchased the rights to Champions League uh, matches on ESPN and then on Fox and on CBS. And then the same thing with, uh, you know, the MLS, you know, building off of the, the, the great world cup that was in 1994 here in the country. Uh, but this sport, and I think, uh, I think men and blazers, uh, their podcast, I think it's, uh, it's, it's the fastest growing sport since 1972 or something like that in the country. I mean, it just, it just hasn't hit yet. And one of the points that was made before was when you get to 13, 14 and you see that players have stopped, um, going forward because maybe the parents don't, uh, you know, are saying, well, you've hit money. it. Well, money. yeah, it's money, but also they also don't know, any other outlet for soccer other than the United States way, because it wasn't part of the culture. And I think culturally it has, uh, this has a lot to do with the issues that this country has with not being where it potentially could be because it just isn't something that we were brought up with. You know, all of us Portuguese guys, we know that, uh, you know, soccer is, 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 you know, next to religion in, in yeah. Portugal. Emery, same with you probably in Turkey as well. And it's all of main, it's, it's everywhere, sport. it's big everywhere except here. Yeah. And it, and it still potentially could be such a awesome sport with a bunch of uh, athletes that can play this game. But if that inherent love for the soccer and love for the sport isn't there, it's hard to replicate that later on. Yeah. Yeah. You're right about that. I think soccer here is a regional thing. You know what I mean? So unlike, say really popular team like the Did New York say, Yankees. You said original or unoriginal? Uh, no, regional. Regional. Okay. Where your team, like for instance, the LA Galaxy, the only fans are in LA. You know what I mean? Like they're packing the stadium. They're, they're, they're not a team. There's no one in North out. Dakota cheering for the Galaxy. Exactly. But there's someone <laughs> in North Dakota cheering will. for 
cheering for the Yankees, right? Cheering for the 49ers. You know what I mean? Like here, it's never, ever going to trump the top three sports in this country. It's, I think it's, I'll be honest, I don't think it's ever going to come close to the top three sports in this country. It never will. Yeah, it just, it just not here. But if that's the goal, they're going to lose. I don't, yeah. And, if, and they're, if, if they want to take a different approach, it, yeah. does, it doesn't. See, I don't think, uh, in, and I'm not saying that you're, that you're saying this off yet, but just, just be who you are and try to improve in that sense. So, yeah, they're never going to beat the NFL or Major League Baseball or, or the NBA, but can't you improve on, what's, uh, on what is the, the system now and, and try to make the MLS a more attractive option? Try to make um, you know, the, the players that you see potential in, you know, try to find outlets to where you can help that family out where, you know, maybe they send them to uh, to coaches that actually have plied their trade in England or have been doing it for 20, 30 years, or just trying to find different outlets instead of just, all right, sign up here. All right. We, we go for 10 weeks and then it's over. And then you'll do it in junior high. You'll do it in high school, do it in college. And then see ya. That's it. You know, there, there's, yeah. The answers aren't easy, but they, they have, there has to be someone who's working on these that are in much higher places than the five of us. Well, yeah. we're working hard. We're working really hard. I right? know you are, man. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> All right, let's take one more break here, and then we'll be right back here on Nerds Talking the Podcast. Up next, we're going to talk about uh, not more or less can it be fixed. What, we've already kind of gone through all the ideas, what everyone has, but... We're going to kind of dip into that. And then we're going to have an opinion on what makes the best player in the world. Oh, that's going to be a good one. Right here on Nerds Talking, the podcast. All right. The game's on. Pass, 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 pass. Okay. Pass, 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 pass. Somebody shoot the damn ball. Pass, pass, pass. Oh, pass. Shoot the damn ball. Okay, pass. Oh, pass, 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 pass. This is why I hate soccer. Pass, pass. Welcome back to Nerds Talking, the podcast, the soccer edition. Uh, we're going to jump into the culture of soccer in the U.S. And, and more or less like you're growing up and how soccer was portrayed to you, uh, how it is, how, how you see it in the U.S. growing up, because some people might see it as, you know, they already knew what it was, but it wasn't part of their, their growing up. Because, for instance, you know, I grew up, you know, well, all of us here in Sacramento, basically. And we we all grow up being Sacramento Kings fans, right? It's kind of just thrown on us. You're a Kings fan. You're from Sacramento. It's what you know. You love the Sacramento Kings. Well, I can't. Can I be a Lakers fan? Uh, you don't want to do that. So, uh, you know, but it's and you're a 49er fan because they're the local team. You know, that's the local team. You're the Ace fan. You're the Giants fan and so forth. In soccer, you didn't have that growing up. You, you know what I mean? You didn't have. You did if your dad said, Oh, I, I like Benfica. Oh, well, what? Uh, when are you going to watch that? Oh, we never, we can't watch it. It's never on here. Oh, then how do you know about it? Oh, I'll, I'll get the newspaper or I'll, or I'll call my cousin in Portugal. He'll tell me what happened, you know, yeah. uh, before the internet, you know. So that's the thing about culture in, in soccer. So then we'll go around the horn. We'll start off with Maurice like, from that perspective. Like, how was it growing up? Was, you know, was soccer really part of the culture for you growing up or? Was it just something you played because, you know, your parents signed you up for it? Uh, it was definitely part of the culture. I mean, coming from a family that's from Europe, you know, um, that's the main sport in Europe. So that's the passion my father had was, was football, soccer. So that's what I was, I was made to play. I remember trying to branch off to play basketball and my dad showed no interest in that whatsoever. <laughs> it was like basketball. Okay, go do that with your mom. I was like, you know, that's what I used to get. So like soccer was pretty much like the first outlet that they even threw at me. Like, this is the only yeah. thing you have to do. This is what I know. This is what I could, I actually have knowledge about what you're doing. I won't be lost. I won't be confused. You know what? That's a, that's a huge thing right there. That's hundred percent. Uh, Danny, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, like much, much like um, Reese was saying, it's, it's born into it. You born, you're born into that, you know, as, as, a, as a person of Portuguese descent, uh, soccer is, is, is everything. It's like I said earlier, it's next to religion. Uh, I, I was lucky enough, my dad uh, coached me uh, in, our, uh, in one of my first years in, when I was five or six years old. Uh, Augie-ish. 
Yeah, with the uh, with the with the Aggies youth team, uh, my uh, uh, my uh, my godfather Manuel, um, uh, João Branco, uh, those all those guys helped mold uh, me the player at a very young age. But uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, you know, they were my my folks were supportive of whatever I wanted to play. Uh, I played a little basketball. Uh, I tried I tried football, but it just never worked out. But uh, but soccer was always the one thing that the entire family understood that the entire family could get behind. And, um, and yeah, that was always, that was instilled to me very, very early on. And I've done it with my kids. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Emery? Uh, the culture similar to you guys, but, um, I brought, uh, in, in Turkey, when you're born, pretty much they tell you which team you're going to cheer for because your background and your family. So since I born, I'm from Fenerbahce. They're one of the uh, biggest teams in Turkey. And you cannot change your flag. You cannot change your team. It is what it is for the bad day, for the good day. <laughs> you're, you're from Fenerbahce. And I was lucky to be able to train with them and able to practice with them and able to play for that. So, nice. but the, it's a dream as a kid, you know what I mean? Play for mm-hmm. the, that major team. And you go to the over the weekend to the games. You go as a group. You cannot just go mom and dad holding hands and we're going to the game. All the all the group from the neighborhood, you jump in the the little um, little cars, station wagons, whatever. You go to the somewhere eat first. Then you go to the stadium. Then uh, during the game, you cheer. You lose your voice. You get sweaty, you get angry, you get happy, whatever the day is, then you lost you lost your voice, you lost your, you know, the all energy. Now you're going back home during the during the uh, between the stadium, the home, there's another story. You know, are you gonna fight or are you gonna celebrate? <laughs> or are you gonna put your head down and criticize the whole game or the club, uh, the uh, the coach, or are you gonna fire the coach or whatever? But that's every weekend. Oh yeah. And that you grow up with and you learn as you go as a child to the to growing up how to behave, what to do, what's going to happen in that, you know, they become a be part of you. It's a different than here. People here they can go they can change teams, they can they can go with their, you know, certain people and if you guys notice that certain part of the stadium they don't cheer they don't scream they don't get excited with the game they just watch very no emotion there's no part of the game and they eat their popcorn i'll tell you one funny story and i'll try to cut cut, cut it short uh in world cup in uh, france i was in europe and we were in spain and uh, one of the good hotels you know the 100 percent good service my ex-wife and uh, i and the kids and everything else and uh, we want to watch the game from the TV. And then my wife, she's, she was American. And she says, oh, let's order pizza and this and that. And everything comes to the room. We can eat. I just look at her. I was like, nothing's going to come. Trust me. So as soon as game start in France, in Spain, in Barcelona, everything stopped. I'm not kidding you. There's no car in the street. Nothing's moving in there. You know, the the around the... The, the city and the street, and we're looking down. I'm looking as like, okay, game start. <laughs> and we ordered a pizza before the game. Guess when the pizza came? After, After the game is over, hour later, they said, hey, <laughs> there's your pizza. And I, I mean, I knew that already, but my wife couldn't believe it. She's like, what kind of service is this? What's going on? I said, hey, people stop everything in Europe. Watch their <laughs> game, regardless what game is. Then after the game, life goes back on reality. Uh, you're not going to see that in the United States, especially no. national maybe, games. Maybe Super Bowl. That's it. Yes, maybe. Super Bowl. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, maybe. How about maybe you, Carlos? If it's not, you just watch it for commercial. <laughs> so, That's true. That's yeah. true. And yeah, see what movies are so, coming out. Sorry if I bore, bore you guys. No, but no, no, the no, no. Between That's, cultures. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. Yeah. Great story. And Carlos, how about you? Well, what's funny is that uh, when we moved to California because uh, I was born in Canada and in Canada my dad coached a soccer team and my neighbors they played soccer we went to go watch 
you know, that, and, but when we moved to, you know, to California, the funny thing is I thought American soccer was for women only. <laughs> that is, because that is all I saw. And then that's all. And then people would make fun of you. Oh, you like soccer? You want to play soccer? You're a girl. You know, that's what was ingrained it in it. It wasn't me. a tough sport. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And wasn't then, um, and it obviously wasn't very popular. Um, but that's what I thought. I thought it was a women's sport. You, U.S. soccer was a women's sport. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, but it is today. I mean, they dominate. I mean, the women's soccer dominates. But it wasn't until the World Cup came to the U.S. I was like, oh, wait a second. No, this is a great sport. I, I love this. I love watching this. I was surprised. You know, because growing up, my cousins played soccer um, and we'd go watch them practice. But for some reason, my dad never put us in soccer, which I was odd. But once, you know, World Cup came, then I caught wind of CCSL. And then I started playing soccer in the CCSL, which is an amateur league. Uh, and I played, I think I played for uh, 12 years in CCSL. And I knew I wasn't going anywhere. It was just to play. I just wanted to be a part of something. I wanted to be a part of the soccer culture because that's what I wanted. So that's, that's my, I mean, that, that was my in introduction to it. Came here, thought it was for women. Not until the World Cup came here that, it, you know, became something else to me. And to this day, I still play. Uh, it hurts to play, but I still play. Um, and I, I mean, my son, he's only 19 months old, but when he gets old enough, I mean, he, he'll kick a ball around, but when he gets old enough, I'm hoping, you know, he, he likes the game enough to play it, you know, yeah. and make something of it. Yeah. I mean, growing up, I mean, I, soccer was not part of anything growing up. Yeah. My dad watched it, but I played high school football. I played baseball. You know, I played organized basketball. My dad came to a football game one time. He was so lost at what was going on <laughs> that at halftime, he just came up to me and said, hey, we're leaving. I said, what do you mean? I don't know what's going on. And they just <laughs> left. And I'm like, you're leaving? The game's still going on. Like, I still have another half to play. Like, nah, we don't know what's going on here. So, but it's just, it, you know what I think it also is in America is there's, too, there's so many options for kids to play sports. It's not, in Europe, soccer is number one. But name two or three other sports that kids gravitate to in Europe. Here, there's so many sports for kids to gravitate to. Now it's basketball over there. Uh, well, yeah, see, now it is because the American culture blew it up. But that's, that's not the same here, you know, in the sense of soccer. Europe doesn't affect soccer here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's dominated by kids. Wanna, kids have so many options. They can play basketball, baseball, football, soccer. I mean, hockey is really popular in the north, northeast you know, you go there and kids don't want to play soccer or can't half the year anyway, but kids don't want to play soccer. They don't want to play baseball or football. They want to play uh, lacrosse, you know, in the Northeast. You know what I mean? There's so many options here for kids to play. And I think some, touching on like college soccer, you're right about one thing. They'll get rid of it in a heartbeat. It doesn't make money. They don't care. They don't give scholarships out for soccer players, but maybe two per team. And, and they give two thousand dollars for it's what I mean. college scholarship. Yeah, for the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, they'll, they'll give you enough for your first two years and go. Oh, that's all. That's all you're getting. This is also the MLS. I mean, uh, I, I remember some of the Czech Republic players, uh, two thousand dollars a month to play, and this is not joke. <laughs> so this is eh. that was their income. That's what they got yeah. paid to play. Yeah, and uh, that's why they left the club because I mean they have to have a job to survive, <laughs> to play Czech Republic. And uh, the funny, uh, there was a one Romanian guy came and try out for Czech Republic about 10 years ago. And uh, he was too much for us. He just came because he has a couple Romanian friends here and he came from Germany and he was playing in the second league on Germany. He just wanted to join and see what they're gonna do with him. You know what I mean? So. They said, oh, you look good, everything else. And, and he's like, you want to play for us? And said, sure. They offer him $50,000. I'm not <laughs> kidding you. And he ended up going to Germany, play for Frankfurt, million oh, nice. and a half. <laughs> he signed up for it. Million and a half is nothing, by the way, oh, in yeah. Germany. I mean, you'll be a broke as a joke as a uh, player. Like the yeah. best you your lifespan, lifespan is another maybe 10 years, maybe five years you're going to play if you don't get hurt. So it's not a big money. So 
And then that's a good point as we talk about the MLS. I just, I don't think players. I mean, people might say, "Well, they're not they're not the talent, they're the money talent of Europe." But players don't get paid very well in the MLS. I think the average salaries maybe ninety thousand dollars. If you someone, if you have yeah, if someone can yeah, if someone can kind of see what that is, but. MLS, that's that's the thing about the MLS. Like I said, MLS is regional. There's two teams here in Los Angeles, and I tell you what, they love their teams in Los Angeles. Oh, they are, they absolutely love the LA FC club, whatever they're called. They love the Galaxy. They sell them out all the time. You know, they, I mean, tell you, it's a regional thing. People, it, what's the Seattle? Seattle has a great MLS fan base. Yeah. Uh, Portland does. I mean, all these teams have a great fan base. Chicago, Again, New York. Chicago, yeah. They just don't travel well. They just, you know, um, and you don't, you, and to be honest, when it's on TV, you, it's, who cares? I've seen LA, LA Galaxy games live. They're a lot of fun, but I don't, I won't watch it on television. I mean, what's the one thing you guys think MLS can do or should do to improve, not necessarily better players, but just improve the product in general, uh, like what would what would be a take you would have, Danny? What would be your take on that? Better players. I just said no <laughs> better it, players. It, exactly. It, honestly, okay, it, what, I, but, what, I, but what makes better players? That's just by name because you know they can't afford the name players. So, do they build their own stars or try to? Because I'm pretty sure they do try to, but again, it's a regional thing. So. Pretty sure LA fans know all their good players, but they don't know all the Columbus players. Sure, I think I think the, the number one thing with the MLS uh, in terms of attracting better players is you're going to have to get them from Europe and from South America once they've passed their prime, because mm -hmm. any any young American player who's plying their trade in the MLS will get signed to a team in Europe. So you can have them start there, but they're not going to stay there. You know, my, uh, uh, Inter Miami just brought in uh, Gonzalo Higuain from, uh, from Juventus. To me, that is a big signing because I think Higuain can still play in, at a high level in Europe. So, but also he's not going to Columbus. He's not going to go to Kansas City. He's going to go to a big market where the MLS wants to uh, make sure that they have star players which is Miami or oh, yeah. New York or the two mm -hmm. L.A. teams. You know, with Sacramento getting, the, uh, getting a franchise now in 2020, I think you got to push back to 2023. I'm not, I'm not dumb enough to think that, you know, in three years we have a chance of getting someone like Lionel Messi or Ronaldo at the end of their career. It's just not going to happen because the money isn't going to be there for that team. To me, what the MLS has to just figure out what it is. And I think it's a regional thing. I'm not going to care about the MLS to be perfectly honest with you guys. I like the product. I have friends who cover the galaxy. Uh, the, they have their own uh, podcast, the corner of the galaxy podcast. I've been following them just because I enjoy their product, but I'm not going to get all into the MLS until the Republic start. And once the Republic yeah. start, then I'm going to be more familiar with, you know, the both teams at both conferences you know, you'll, you'll obviously gravitate to the players that are on your team. And then you'll kind of start seeing how the league works. The designated player stuff, the allocation money, that's a lot of convoluted BS because there's ways to circumvent that stuff. And the bigger, and the bigger market teams have been able to do that. They've been able to trade players to get other clubs allocation money so that they can bring in guys like Zlatan Ibrahimovic and Terry Henry and David Villa and Andre Pirlo. But I just don't think that there's – I don't think there's a fix, Lafayette, to, to answer your question. I just think that it's just going to be a slow burn to get better players. But at the end of the day, the product is, is going to be the product. And I, I don't think as it currently it situates itself in the, in the lexicon of sports in this country, it's just going to be what it is. And I enjoy the product personally. I enjoy that it exists. I think it's – very, very beneficial to a lot of kids in this country. Uh, Emery, the, the one thing, like, uh, you're, you work for, is it Placerville United? Placer United. Placer United, I'm sorry. This, this uh, section of California, you have Placer, 
Folsom, Roseville, Sacramento, Davis, Elk Elk Grove. Grove. In terms of a hotbed of soccer, I think it's a great, great thing that this region is going to get get themselves an MLS franchise. That's why it started off so well, if you think about it. Yeah. Like when the Republic got here, 20,000 seats sold out at Hughes Stadium three weeks in a row. It's more than a Kings game. You know, it's like... Yeah, and, so, and, and that franchise is going to do great in terms of attendance because there's so many kids in this region playing soccer. But we have to also be realistic about what it's going to be, and it's just going to, it's going to be an MLS franchise. And yeah. unless it is a right-out-the-gate, super uh, successful MLS franchise, we're going to exist because we're going to sell tickets and we're going to, have, we're going to make money that way but we're not going to attract any, anything different than what the, the, what the current player scale is. Yeah, and, and I think MLS is NFL Europe. You know what I mean? Where we're, all, we're always going to look at the Premier League as premier, so like the number one soccer, no matter what. So when someone brings up MLS, you go, oh, yeah, that's like minor league soccer. You ever, you ever seen the Premier League? You know, like that's kind of the take on that. But I got an update. Average, average salary of an MLS player, $345,000. I was gonna say that. I was waiting. You were gonna say the exact <laughs> yes, number. Yeah. Hold on. That average. I looked it up. That average. That's average. That's the average, average salary. That's the average. Yeah, so that's, that's basically the, the lowest. So somebody gets the top, and the rest of them don't. The other guy gets like ninety thousand. <laughs> oh yeah, it yeah. Says it's like true. It's, it's seventy thousand no. a week that a player makes. Yeah, minimum. which is good. I mean, he said, <laughs> they get that much. I start playing back again. For Sign me years. up. I'm <laughs> ready to go. All right. That's not bad. okay, Carlos. What's your take on the MLS? Well. When it first started, um, I, to me, I mean, I'm glad, like Danny said, I'm glad Sacramento's getting MLS because I'll definitely go watch games. Uh, but the biggest reason I'm going to go watch the games is not because of Sac Republic because I want to see the other teams when they bring the older players from Europe to come play. <laughs> like the Kings I'm, back in the day. Well, exactly. Like uh, when L.A. got Beckham, I went to the game to watch Beckham. I didn't go because I was an L.A. Galaxy fan. I could care less. I was there to see Beckham, right? And then I... I didn't get a chance to see Ibrahimovic. I would love to have seen that guy. To me, the MLS is the retirement home for great players. Yep. They know they can still play. Call. Right. They know they can still play, but they're not starters anymore on their home teams or in Europe or anything, right? But they can still play. They can come over here and they can dominate the game. I mean, and, and to me, the MLS, when it first started, I never took it seriously because, I mean, come on. U.S. has this tendency to try to make – something popular and make it their own. I mean, they had two point circles for crying out loud when the game first started. If you could score from that circle, it was worth two points. Just leave the game alone and just try to, I mean, try to make it your own, but don't change the rules. I mean, don't try to convolute. It's, it was just ridiculous. That's why I've never taken it seriously. And I don't think I ever will. I mean, Europe soccer will always be in premier league and, you know, um, you know, Madrid, Barcelona, and all those teams, and all those, you know, France. Those to me are real soccer, but MLS, like I said, it's just retirement league. I want to go watch Sac Republic when they bring another player over. You know, maybe I'll go watch, if he's still in the league at the time, maybe I'll go watch Nani because he plays for Miami currently, I believe. Is, am I correct? Danny, is that uh, right? Orlando. Orlando, right. And it, is Kaka, is he in, is he still playing? I think, he, I think he's done. I think oh, he's okay. Done, yeah. Like Rooney came over for a little bit, but you know he got to play and he he dominated. But he went back home and I don't even hear his name anymore. He's a he's he a player coach. Stay here. No, he's a player coach. Better better. Option. Oh, is he? It just yeah. shows you the talent level from like United States talent level to Europe talent levels. Right. Way there's a big gap. Big gap. Oh, well, you know, and yeah. I, I agree with the I agree with the the retirement uh, league to a certain extent. I think the I think it's gotten better though simply because, you know, Ibrahimovic was here and now he's back at AC Milan yeah. scoring goals. You know, uh, who, uh, yeah, Beckham was here for, for a while and he still went to go play uh, for, uh, for AC Milan as well. And so I, I, I do think the, in, uh, the, the, the whole thing as, uh, as a league, yeah, it's a retirement league per se. I don't think it's as big of a retirement league as it used to be, but, it's the, but, the, but the way it's built is still aging stars, bring them over, cash in as much as you can. Um, and, and then, and then just, you know, if they're done, they're done at the end of it. And if they want to move on and go back to Europe, if they still have the, a little bit of juice, yeah, go for it. Yeah. And you had a good point about Ibrahimovic. He, 
revitalized his career through the MLS. He dominated so much that a team in Europe was like, oh, bring him back. Bring, don't let him stay there anymore. Bring him back right now. And he's, he's doing it over there. He's dominating again over there. I mean, Emery, what's your take on the MLS? Uh, I go different direction than you guys. I know because you guys want to see some stars in MLS. Yeah, bring old uh, retired players from Europe all over the countries. I'd rather bring the MLS to the different level, the excitement, the speed, and like a college basketball, college football. So I'd rather play the youth American players instead of somebody from Europe somewhere, you know, the, the, we, can, we can do that as a show games. We can do that as a off-season games or some kind of tournaments to see those players. But when you bring somebody old and then taking spot and taking a lot of money from the table, it kind of kills the youth soccer in the United States to, to play in front of the crowd, play, play in the stadium, and, and uh, digest that and able to become a United soccer player, United na national team. So because this retirement guys comes in with the agenda, all about them. Nothing about the youth, uh, not, nothing about the United States soccer. So I rather put a limitation. I will say, okay, you're gonna bring that kind of player. You can only pay this much amount of money for this guy, because you're taking that money from the pool you're giving them. I rather give another five youth American player promote the soccer, and they get paid. Oh, that will become a goes trickle down to the 14 years old kid. I want to be like him. I want to pay, get paid like that and play like that. And also brings the excitement. When I watch the MLS game, I fall asleep. I'm sorry. There's no excitement. So predictable. And then you know the game, what's going to happen. And uh, if you're okay with it, I'm, I'm not okay with it. I want the unpredictable game. I don't want to know what's going to happen every five minutes, you know. And I want the cheer. I want the, I want the excitement in the stadium. Just like, a, you know, when you watch the college football and uh, that you don't know the scores, it can go anywhere and excitement. So I think that will draw more people to go come and watch and also related to them, related to see their own players and from United States. I want to be like him. I don't want to see my kids saying I want to be a Beckham. He's an English guy and he's not going to relate it. If my kids are American, I want to say, hey, I want to play like Joe. Joe's good. So I give you a funny story. Drogba came to you know the United States MLS. You know he didn't do any any practice with the team, right? He didn't do practice with them. He just came to the game because it was too cold for him. And he came to the game and he scored because he knew that already. He's playing so high level. I mean, there's no point. He practices at home. He just came to the game and he got paid. And that's to me is a craziness, you know. So. I agree one point, you know, to make this soccer lovable in the United States. But all the parents watching the uh, Premier League, Spanish League, German League, whatever, everything is everywhere now. In the tri But when I'm in the stadium, I want to be part of my my team, my players. Hopefully it makes sense. So. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes complete sense. All right. Well, we'll come back right after this with our last segment, the best player in the world and what makes him the best player. Right after this on Nerds Talking, the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Turn on notifications for new episodes every Friday. Nerds Talking, the podcast. Welcome back to Nerds Talking, the podcast, the soccer special edition. And we've touched a lot on U.S. soccer from youth all the way to the MLS. But now it's time for the big question. Who is the best player, not just in the world, maybe the best player you've ever seen, but what qualifies a player to be the best in the world or even at the moment? So, you know, instance... Uh, Michael Jordan, we always say he's the best basketball player ever. And we all watched him play and we, he won championships, the stats, so on and so forth. But soccer is different. Soccer has a million different leagues going on. There's different cups. There's different championships. You know, there's, diff there's different, uh, there's different w w tiers, I guess, 
to a, a player, you know? Um, so what makes, first of all, gonna, first you're going to tell me who you're, who the best player is in your opinion and why he's the best player. And then we'll all fight each other. All right. <laughs> so here we go. We'll start with Maurice. Maurice, give me your take on the best player. What makes the best player? What's the criteria for what you would consider the best player in the world? You really have to ask me that question. Like I know, I know. You, are you gonna uh, say you're yeah, probably gonna say Landon Donovan? But go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, Clint Dempsey. Ah, very uh, nice. You know, no. Uh, for me, I, it, for me, for sure, it's Cristiano Ronaldo. You know, because like I've seen the guy since he was like 17 playing. You know, Manchester United coming across and just to see to see that kind of player play at that level for our country, our na- our nation. It's like. Wow, you know, and it helps people like, oh, you're Portuguese? Yo, Cristiano Ronaldo, you know? And that's what I get a lot, you know? But for me, like, what has – he's a crazy athlete, just uh, a great goal scorer. And then the thing that just, like, gets me, like, amazed is longevity. Longevity. It's long just – Long jiff. Longevity. Like, <laughs> longevity. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. He's played forever. Like yeah. he's already passed, like his age now, we would already see him other players in the MLS, you know, like doing the retirement parade, whatever you want to call it. But he's still playing and he's he's pushing at a pace where he still makes his teams competitive. And it's amazing to me, you know, it's like where you see these guys, how old's Cristiano Ronaldo now? 35. 30, 34, 35? 35, yeah. Yeah, it, you don't see guys playing that long. And they're already done. They, they don't even want to play for the national team. They don't even want to play. They're ready just to make their money. He's still like his, he's still striving to make national soccer for Portugal, like good. And he's still trying to bring them a world cup win and a Euro cup. And he's like, he still wants to play. And that's, that's amazing to me. You know, there we go. So Maurice, one point for Ronaldo Emery, who is the best player in the world and what makes the best player in the world? Well, it defines, and everybody has their own understanding and uh, what's the best. I look at it differently, and Cristiano Ronaldo is a very good player, very good, you know, and also idol for a lot of players that they look up and want to be like. And um, it has a lot of qualities, but I look at it a little bit differently. I look at Messi, you know what I mean? Before Messi, there was other players like Johan Cruyff. Beckenbauer, you guys don't know those are now those are my age group, Pele, and uh, this type of players, they has a characters. You know, they they not just they're good, they also makes the, their teammates look good. So they carry the team. Zidane uh, from Real Madrid. I don't know you guys watched Zidane in the past. Mm-hmm. Very talented, and uh, I think okay. he, he, he he played the World Cup. You guys know the butt head, you know, the, head butt. And he was going to be the most, most uh, MVP in that. So these are the players that they have a leadership in the team that they have a magnetism. They pull together the rest of the players and win as a team. They don't just put their own effort with their number, but they make the other players look good too. And they get looked up and they have loyalty when they play this play. If you guys look at them, they don't change teams. They don't go anywhere. They stay in the same club. So, and hopefully makes sense. They don't go after money. Money comes to them. So the uh, club doesn't, they don't think about to sell them out or trade them. Hopefully makes sense because their leadership and their influence in the team. So that's why I say Leon, uh, Leonard Messi. Yeah, no, that's a good answer. I mean, I think for sure you have to look at, because I Carlos and I got into this, couple of weeks back about best player in the world it always depends on your personal preference because your club player your favorite club player to you could be the best player in the world because he's dominating in that league and in that club yeah somebody that plays in the you know the wales wales whatever soccer league and he's you never heard of him but over there he is the ronaldo of the league and you're like that guy's amazing and you know he might be you know but we know he's not which we we're, we're using an example so go ahead danny give me your uh, best player your criteria, how, you know, how you kind of see it for uh, soccer? Uh, for me, it's, it has to be that you balance being the star 
with wearing the armband. And, and again, it, it, one of us is going to say Messi, one of us is going to say Ronaldo. I don't know if there's going to be any other options in terms of current players, but you really can't go wrong with either one. Personally, I'm going to go with Ronaldo simply because he's been the captain of the national team now for over a decade. He had the captain's armband put on his, on his arm at a very, very early age. Something that I thought was crazy at the time, but in terms of just the national team aspect of it, he has this, he's had this Michael Jordan type impact on kids in Portugal to where now you're seeing these kids who are, you know, 20, 21, uh, making the national team and now playing with the idol that they grew up looking at and, and watching when he was playing at Manchester United and when he was playing at Real Madrid. Um, he is, you know, both these players, uh, uh, Ronaldo and Messi, they are once in a multi, multi generational talent. We are arguably looking at the two greatest to ever play this game. Uh, but where, where, I, where I see the advantage, I guess, between Ronaldo and, and, uh, and Messi, you know, Emery had, uh, had, uh, had, had said that, you know, you know, I mean, Ronaldo's on his like fourth club, I think. Messi's been Barcelona through and, uh, through, and through, and and that's that's commendable. Um, I uh, to me, it's I look at I look at the leader more on the national side with Ronaldo than I do on the club side. Uh, I think that Messi has a more of a leadership role on the club side than he than he does with uh, Argentina. I don't think that they've excelled to where they should have. Uh, I think that, you know, they had their opportunity against Germany in the World Cup. And Germany was such a great team that they or that uh, that World Cup. It was going to be hard anyway. But uh, I just think in terms of best player, I think having the international success that Ronaldo has had over over Messi puts him over the top for me. And then but what a leadership or what a leader does to me is no matter how bright the star is, he makes sure that those around him uh, feel just as important and play just as important because if you can raise your teammates level up on the field, I think it's a, I think it's a great, great sign of how good, a good of a leader uh, you can be. Um, Emery brought up Zidane. I don't think there's been a more smoother player ever on the field. Mm -hmm. Him, him and Ronaldinho, in terms of just aesthetics of watching people, uh, watching uh, football, watching soccer, probably my two favorites ever uh, that I've ever seen. They're just the smoothness on the field. There's a skill level there on both those players that cannot be touched. And probably Johan Cruyff, uh, Emery mentioned, probably that's the generation before, two generations before, were very similar players to, uh, to them in terms of just the smoothness and the fluidity of, uh, of the field, or on the field, I should say. But a lot of choices. A lot of choices. I almost put. Uh, I almost put used to too. smoke cigarette in the halftime. You know that, right? Between the during the game. Why well, doesn't it doesn't shock me at all? Two packs of cigarette during the game. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Back in the days, he used to smoke on the sideline and put them out there. We were like, "What the heck?" You know. And this guy has a such a phenomenal speed that uh, you couldn't catch the guy on the field. Nice. And Carlos, your take on what makes the best player in the world. I know your answer. You guys are all the same. Well, to me, I, I mean, I'm mean, not gonna give you the obvious answer and say Ronaldo, but it's always to me, it's always a toss up between Messi and Ronaldo because I think maybe it's because of how um, Ronaldo is also uh, portrayed in the in the media. I mean, when you when they talk about the two, they always say that well, Messi is a bigger team player. I mean, he you know he hangs out with Neymar. He hangs out with. Uh, uh, Suarez, or when he was on the team, you know, when those two guys were on the team, it seemed like these three guys were like buddies and hanging out, right? And it made it look like, you know, he made he made people want to play in Barcelona because, hey, I want to go play with Messi because he's a nice guy. That's what it came out to be. And then, like Emery pointed out, um, Ronaldo seems to follow the money, right? I mean, that doesn't make him a bad player. I mean, obviously, teams want him. Like Lafayette, you had mentioned. Well, there might be a guy in Wales who might be the Cristiano Ronaldo of Wales. But I'm sure if you follow that team in Wales and you heard Ronaldo's coming, you're like, well, who the hell was that guy? We want Ronaldo, right? 
So, I mean, anybody would want to pick this guy up. So, because of that, I, I'd have to go with Ronaldo. I mean, I know Messi has won more uh, Ballon de Oro than I mean, won more than Ronaldo, but that doesn't make him a better player, right? I mean, and like Danny had said, on a national level, Ronaldo's definitely, I mean, he's definitely the guy that you want to lead your team. Because, I mean, Messi, I don't, I don't remember the last time he was even in Argentina, right? I mean, he's been in Spain. He's not an Argentini. He's, he's a right. Spanish. He's Spanish, he's right? He's been old. there since he's at least 12, I believe. Yep. And he's never gone home. He only goes home when he's playing for the national team. So because of that, you know, because of like, I have to decide with Danny on this, because of how he leads the national team, Ronaldo gets my vote on that. Yeah. All right. There we go. So we have um, a one Let Messi. Let me ask you one question. Yeah. What's the first team that Ronaldo played? Sporting. Sporting. Yeah. Sporting yeah, Lisbon, but, not Benfica. Yeah. No, no, I never, I never played from there. Oh, no, it's all right. It's okay. No, but, we're, we've, we've lived with that fact. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, that's fine. That's, so, yeah, Sporting, we, but Sporting has all the you, best players in Portugal. But if you yeah, change a tint on your TV, you can easily make green turn red. So, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. yeah uh, so, we got three Ronaldos and one Messi. I go with Mbappe. Uh, plays in France. Uh, Kylian Mbappe, he's, uh, he's on the cover of FIFA soccer. That's pretty yeah, much the only reason, reason I'm choosing him because he's on the cover of FIFA soccer. <laughs> you, That's it. You, get, you, get, you get to use him on your team when you buy a pre-order the game. So there you go. Um, Ronaldo was on the cover plenty of times. So pass it on to the next guy. But yeah, that's, uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you, you guys, when you say Ronaldo is the best player in the world. Essentially, people that don't necessarily follow soccer, they just know who Ronaldo is. And, and the thing is, Ronaldo is that type of player where, Oh yeah, that guy's really good, huh? They never really watch soccer. They, what they know, like they know Ronaldo is like the guy in soccer, and they they probably never never watched it. And that's kind of what he carries. He carries that stigma of, oh, like it's like Maurice said, oh, you're Portuguese, oh, Ronaldo, huh? And that's all they'll say to you, and that they know nothing about soccer. They just say that Ronaldo. He's globally he's known. Yeah, and then you, then you throw the whole, oh, yeah, he's related to me. No way. They don't know. They barely know where Portugal <laughs> is. So, um, but, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. He has, he definitely is worldwide. He, he's that guy worldwide. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that. But when it comes to Messi, he, he's not that guy in that, in that aspect. In, in the soccer culture aspect, he's not that big. I mean, he's, he's massive, but. He's also five foot five or something like that. I think so. Ronaldo has like the most Instagram followers in the world. Well, there you go. It's either him or Ariana yeah. Grande. That yeah, I think him. it's a tie. It could be a tie. I thought it was The Rock. <laughs> no, I no. I think it's Ariana Grande. Hey, and one. Emery, anyone who beats COVID, you know, and Messi hasn't done it yet. Ronaldo's already beat COVID, so oh, it's uh, he's definitely number one. <laughs> so Ronaldo has a Euro Championship. He has a. Does he have a Premier Championship? With he's, with got, he's got he's got premier he's got mm -hmm. champions league he's got uh the he has, um, a, he has a spanish cup doesn't he oh yeah he's done he's done it all man and he beat covid think about and that he beat, yeah good Euro Euro COVID, yeah this guy could run for president yeah she should probably i was wondering you're you gonna say hiv he's not a family man me know no that. he's not i won't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that that's where we part company i guess yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. the best He's the best. Great. He's, He's a awesome. true soccer player. He's a party man. Yes, yes, uh, man. He, when you go over to uh, Portugal, he he his face is on everything. Of course, yeah, every, it's but I mean, talking about everything. Like you go and buy like a pastry in a box. He has his own. Which it should be. Which it should be because that's the one Portugal players that over the world. Hopefully, makes sense. Oh yeah, no, you're it's, right. It's a, it's a no doubt. You know that should be that should be right way, and then, and I have a respect for that because he, when it comes to professionalism in the game, he works out. He doesn't have just talent. He goes out there and do the job. Watch his oh, weight. Yeah. Watch his fitness. You know, it's it's a he respect that part of the 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 game. Some players don't. If you guys notice that, when they make money, they get um, with the girls, the parties, they get sloppy, and they will get disappeared. I'll give you a perfect example. George Best. He was one of the most talented players on the field. But George Best got lost in the clubs. He was drunk half of the game. 
he had a hangover before he um, before he comes to the game practices. So, but yeah, we lost him. He was the one of the guy when he goes to the field. Oh man, you will love to watch the guy. Wasn't that a thirty for thirty? I think on ESPN. Yeah. I think if you look it up, you'll see that it's a it's a really good one too. All about George Best and yeah, how he basically threw his career away. Yes, because he just loved. The party we used to go to the uh, the movie theaters to watch because we didn't have the TVs those days, and used to watch the news on the the theaters, and we used to go out there and watch George Best games for half an hour. It was a black yeah. and white, and one of the fastest guy. But the, the, so sometimes now- that fame it gets you take you the wrong way. That's why this Messi and Ronaldo. They're able to control that. They, I mean, Ronaldinho, you said Ronaldinho get sloppy. You know, he ended up getting jailed and got in the, you know, the tax uh, problems and everything else. Some players got lost like that. But certain players, they kept their personality and they kept their professionalism. So that's, it, both players are great. So. Like Mark, like um, what's, the, what's the hand of God? What's his name? Maradona. Yeah, clean player right there. All right. Well, there yeah. we go. There we go. Well, there we go. Everybody has their opinion on the best player currently in the world. And um, my one thing, uh, anybody here see Ted Lasso, the soccer show? Love it. Apple Great TV. Show. Yeah. So if you love soccer, you have to watch Ted Lasso. It is flipping awesome. Oh, Jamie Tart's my favorite player. In oh, yes. I knew you. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah, and you know what? He's okay if he fixes his attitude. He'll be all right. He'll be all yeah, right. Got a, got a nice haircut. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's a little bit of a, a underbite or something. Maybe we just, <laughs> maybe just fix that. But anyway, so that there you go. Thanks for tuning in to Nerds Talking. Our soccer specialist been a great uh, little around the horn, but all the topics we touched on. Join us next time here on Nerds Talking, the podcast for Danny, Maurice, Emery, and Carlos, and I'm Lafayette. See you next time. Nerds Talking, the podcast, brought to you by NerdsReviews.com, your home for movie, tech, and video game reviews, only at NerdsReviews.com.